So uh, thanks to everyone for, uh, for, for, for joining. I'm going to spend some time today uh, attempting to demystify machine learning from an investing perspective. Um, so I'd encourage you all to ask questions as we go along, which I'm told you can do. Uh, and we'll try and answer as many as we can at the end. Um, so, so undoubtedly, machine learning and investing is overhyped. Um, a somewhat crude analogy I heard once was that machine learning and investing uh, is like teenage sex in high school. Everyone says that they're doing it because they think that everyone else is doing it. Uh, but really, most people aren't doing it. And the few that are, are probably doing it wrong. Um, now, I think that view might be a bit outdated today. Um, so machine learning is no longer some secret source that a few clandestine quant hedge funds are using in some niche part of the economy anymore. Um, it's far more ubiquitous. Um, so as someone who used to be uh, completely dismissive uh, of, of these techniques, my goal today is uh, to convince you that beneath the hype, uh, there are many potential use cases uh, for you as an investor. Uh, and I wanna share some mental models and analogies that I employ for getting to grips with the main concepts. So if you engage with this material uh, with a growth mindset, then hopefully it empowers you to get your hands dirty in adding machine learning to your toolbox or to at least be more informed in your skepticism of it. So I'm not gonna walk through the, uh, the whole agenda now, uh, but I will say that obviously there is far more to this field than can be covered in 30 minutes. So I'd encourage you to ask questions uh, if something isn't clear. And I've left a short page of resources at the end for you uh, to continue on your journey after this presentation. So to dive right in, um, machine learning is not a new distinct field. Uh, it's the intersection between computer science and statistics. So I'm gonna go into the main way it differs from computer science uh, and the main ways it differs from traditional statistics. So I should highlight up front that I am not an expert in machine learning. My training is in finance and traditional research, uh, the green area on the right in this graphic. Um, and we're going to touch on how to use machine learning to enhance traditional research in the investment domain and hopefully move us more towards the heroically named unicorn status in this, the, the middle of this graphic here. So I'm gonna start with a, a stylized example in differentiating machine learning from traditional programming. And that's validating a password. So a 1950s computer scientist uh, using old school computer programming would have a process that looks like this. Um, you'd enter a password and the program goes through if statements to determine if the password you entered is valid. So at the top here, does the password have eight characters or more? And does it include a lowercase letter? And does it include an uppercase letter, et cetera, et cetera? If it fulfills these criteria, then it's valid or else it's invalid. And you're getting a definite answer. Is it valid or not? Instead of a list of preset rules, uh, machine learning uses data to determine the rules. So in this illustration, we have labeled data, that's examples of passwords, and whether they're valid or not. So the first one, one, two, three, four, five, that is not valid because it's not the right length and it doesn't include an uppercase or lowercase letter. The second example, which I hope none of you use, is the word password. And this is not valid because even though it's the right length, it does not include an uppercase letter. The third example there, that is valid because it passes all of the criteria. And the last one there referencing your favorite football team, um, it's also valid because it fulfills all of these criteria. So if you combine all of this data with a statistical model and you get a, a probabilistic answer for whether the password that you entered is valid or not. So in this simple example here, um, getting a definite answer is better than a probabilistic one which has some uncertainty. Since we have some uh, clear rules and we prefer a black and white answer on whether those rules have been followed or not. So the traditional programming approach here makes, makes more sense. So why would we use machine learning? Well, because most problems do not have easy to code rules like this. And often the exact rules are not always clear or known in advance. 
And why machine learning has become more popular recently is the explosion in the availability of data to train these algorithms. Now, uh, moving on to how machine learning differs from traditional statistics that we use in finance. This is a admittedly very stylized summary of how, um, of, of how it differs. So with traditional statistics, we first start by making some assumptions about our data. For example, that the observations are independent and identically distributed. Then we choose a model based on those assumptions or not. So quite often in finance, we're, we're choosing a model for simplicity, even though we know that the data violates those assumptions. Um, then we solve an equation to maximize the explanatory power within all of our data. So we're focused on explaining the data that we have. And as a result, we get a mathematical formula for the best fit given these assumptions. Um, so uh, to sort of summarize, you get answers which are biased and you know why they're biased. And that's usually because the data breaches the assumptions that you've made. Um, the machine learning approach, you, you choose a method, you train a model on the data, uh, and then you use trial and improvement to minimize the out of sample error. So you're focused on prediction here, on predicting outcomes outside of your data set. Um, so the summary is that you've, you've made no assumptions, but you don't have a specific math formula that you can use to explain how you got your results. Um, another way of saying it is that you end up with less biased answers, but the rules that the machine learning algorithm is using to get those answers are not always clear. So if you're not familiar with programming and maybe you're a bit rusty on your statistics, then at this point, you're probably ready to log off and go watch something more interesting on Netflix. So before you do that, what I'll do now is I'm going to walk through the intuition behind what we've discussed with visual illustrations only. No equations and no code. And I'm going to use a simple toy example, uh, which investors should be familiar with. And that's the relationship between valuation and stock returns. So. We want to know what the relationship is between valuation and returns. On the left, we've got some valuation and returns data on different stocks, returns on the y-axis from high to low, and valuation, uh, that's the cheapest valuation on the left to the most expensive on the right. The traditional statistical approach um, for finding this relationship would be to draw a line of best fit through the data. This is ordinarily squares or linear regression. The, um, so uh, th this simple model enables you to infer what the return on any stock would be given its valuation. In this example, um, a stock with a valuation of three, whatever that means, you would infer that that's got a return slightly less than zero. So because our model is uh, linear and monotonic, so it's always downward sloping in this case, the, uh, the economic intuition from the model is that cheaper valuation always equals higher return. Now you can measure the accuracy of the model more formally. So if we take the, the data on the left and on, on the right here, we are measuring the distance between all of the data points and the model prediction. So that's the green line. And you get these red lines, the, the distance between. Uh, these are the errors in your model. And if you take all of these red lines, you square them, and you take the average, you get the mean squared error of 1.06. And I put it at the top there. Now, minimizing the mean squared error is how this line is drawn, which is why it's called least squares, the best fit. Now, you can see visually the model is overestimating the returns for the cheaper stocks the leftmost data points. Um, and it's underestimating the returns for the, uh, the cheap stocks, but which are closer to average valuation. So you could interpret this toy example economically as saying that the cheaper stocks are value traps and they have lower returns. And basically you don't want to be in the cheaper stocks, um, but you want to be in cheap stocks that are not the, you know, the most cheap. But without any, any formal analysis and just by looking at the raw data on the left chart, um, you can already tell that it doesn't matter how you draw a straight line. You can't properly capture and explain the relationship. There's going to be large errors. So what can we do about this? Well, if we, if we put our, our, our linear model from the previous page on the left 
uh, on the right, we're now going to allow more flexibility for the model to minimize this mean squared error. And you can see there are more complex model in orange perfectly fits the data. There's no error bars and it's got perfect explanatory power. So both models have the objective of minimizing mean squared error, but the one on the right does a better job because it's given more flexibility to do so. Um, so does this mean that the model on the right is better? Well, at this point, it's worth asking yourself whether minimizing mean squared error is the correct objective for us as investors. So we take our two models and put those on the left, um, which we fitted to our original data, which were the blue data points. But now we're going to use those models on a new set of data. That's the, the, the points in green on the right. And then we're going to measure the errors. So you can think of this new data as other stocks or valuation and returns data over different time periods for the same stocks. Um, and if we if we do that, so again, it's the the the, the original data on the left, and our, our, on the right we've got our two models on the new data. So the red are the error bars for the linear model, but now we've got blue error bars. So the complex model, the orange line, has got errors in this new data. And if I sh show the formal measures, the mean squared error of each, you can see that whilst the linear model, um, for the linear model, the mean squared error did increase slightly. It went from 1.06 on the left to 1.1 on the right. The complex model increased a lot. So it had no errors originally, and it went to 0.48. So this illustrates one of the main issues you'll be confronted with in uh, machine learning, and that's overfitting. So here we were purely focused on the past with no allowance for the possibility that the future is not exactly the same as the past. So your model will do very well in explaining the data that you showed it in the past, but it ends up with poor performance when faced with new data in the future. So a big clue that you might be overfitting is when a simpler model would have done, uh, had a lower error than your, than your complex model. So just to confuse things further, I'm going to add a third model, and that's the dashed black line there. And, and this one is slightly more complex than the simple straight line, but uh, less flexible than the complex orange model. So on the original data, um, this new model has a, a mean squared error that's low, but it's not zero. It doesn't perfectly fit all of the data points. And testing on new data, we can see that uh, uh, flexi more flexibility isn't always better. So our third model still has higher error when faced with new data. It's gone from 0 0.32 to 0 0.39. However, the increase in error is less than the increase in error of the complex model. And overall, our third model ends up having the best performance on the new data. Um, it's got the lowest mean squared error. So here I'm summarizing all of the, the previous charts. I'm taking the mean squared errors from, um, uh, from before, and I'm going to make a general point about model flexibility and accuracy. So ordered from left to right are how flexible the models are. You've got our straight line, the uh, green squares in the top left, the fully flexible orange model, the squares, uh, orange squares on the right, and our third model in black and white in the middle. So there's, there's two lines on this chart. The bottom light blue line was the mean squared error on the original blue data points. The top line is the, uh, the light green line in the mean squared error on the new green data points. So I've, as I've mentioned before, our straight line, right, our original simple linear model is too basic um, because in using this model, we're assuming that the relationship is linear. When even from eyeballing the data, we knew that the data probably breached this assumption. Uh, and no matter how much data we were going to give this simple linear model, it would never be able to explain the nonlinear relationship between valuation and returns well. Uh, as we introduced more flexibility, what our, uh, our sort of third model there, the, the slightly more flexible model, we reduced the bias, we reduced the error. However, when our models became too flexible, so the, the orange squares there, um, it didn't generalize well outside of the training data. So we introduced variance into the model's performance between data sets. So, so this, should, uh, this should ring true for investors, um, Markowitz portfolio 
portfolio optimization, for example, works, the future looks exactly like the past. The problem is with the financial assets, past risk and returns don't necessarily make useful predictions of future risk and returns. So ideally, what we want is we want a low bias and a low variance, and that's like the target on the right. So it's always consistently, consistently hitting the bullseye. Um, what we want to avoid is being high bias and high variance on the left. Um, trading off between bias and variance in the middle two targets is, is where it becomes more of an art than a science. Um, so would you rather risk having high bias where your aim is slightly off, but you're consistent? Or would you rather risk having high variance where you're right on average, but there's a lot of variation each time you throw a dart? So the bias variance trade-off is a key concept in machine learning um, because the models have so much flexibility, uh, you need to determine how much of each you want to allow. Now, due to the dangers of, of overfitting, uh, there are many machine learning methods to manage it. Um, so one way is to take the data, uh, as I show here from our toy example, and to split it. Then, to use one part of the data for training the algorithm and one part for measuring its accuracy. So this ensures the model never sees the whole data set during the training process. And that prevents our uh, model from fitting all of the noise. So uh, this thinking is similar to testing your investment process out of sample. For example, testing whether your strategy works in other countries or other asset classes outside of where it was originally developed. And there are more elaborate ways of splitting the data, uh, including cross-validation. So here you split the data into training and test sets many times and many different ways. Then your final model is an average across all of these iterations. Um, this, this, so this reduces the risk of overfitting any one part of the data. And you can actually use this method with traditional statistics. So in portfolio construction, naively using a sample covariance matrix or a correlation matrix as an estimate is essentially using what has happened in the past exactly as a prediction of the future. Um, so this is overfitting to the time period over which you've calculated those covariances or correlations. So uh, you can use cross-validation in that sense uh, when you're estimating your covariance matrix, which can make it more applicable on a forward-looking basis. Now, going back to our toy data, um, I've only been showing you examples using valuation as a single predictor, since it's easy to illustrate. The relationships become increasingly abstract and hard to visualize as you add more variables, and especially as the relationships uh, become nonlinear. Uh, so here, if we take our toy data from earlier a little bit further, we're adding, in addition to valuation, a measure of company quality as a second predictor of returns. So now this is a 3D chart um, with the data points spanning returns on the vertical axis, uh, valuation on the horizontal axis, and quality going into the page. So in, instead of a line, our model now becomes a surface. And here we can see that low valuation and higher quality predict higher returns on their own. The chart slopes upwards with higher quality, that's the right-hand edge, and upwards with low valuation, so that's the bottom edge of the um, surface. But uh, together, cheap and high quality have, been, uh, have had by far the highest returns, and these are the points in the corner of the chart, so that's where the green area is. Uh, now, practically, in investing, we may have many more than just two predictors uh, that we believe could be related to stock returns. So when we're using more than two predictors, we can't visualize the relationship since we can't perceive beyond three dimensions. Um, I mention this because this is where machine learning can really add value, uh, since it can fit complex nonlinear interactions between millions of variables if we wanted which is very difficult for us to even comprehend without being able to visualize a million dimensional space. So, so the issue of interpretability is another trade-off that you need to make uh, when you're choosing machine learning model. So machine learning is a very broad church in there and there are many different methods um, and there's no one single best method that dominates for all use cases uh, and depends on the context in which you're using it. 
each has its own trade-offs and, and this diagram shows a few of the most popular methods on a spectrum of accuracy and interpretability. Now I'd love to go into detail in applying each of these in an investment context, um, but uh, that's a whole other presentation. So I'm just gonna highlight a few. I'm gonna spend a few moments talking about neural networks at the bottom there. So these are probably the most famous machine learning algorithm. Um, they're vaguely inspired by the neural networks in animal brains. Uh, and they're so well known because of the levels of accuracy that they've managed to achieve in areas such as image recognition and speech recognition and in beating human players at various games uh, such as Go so famously in the last few years. Deep learning, which is an extremely popular area at the moment, is utilizing deep neural networks. So that's neural networks with lots of different layers. Um, now the, the other algorithm which I'm, I'm gonna spend a bit of time on are decision trees and random forests, which are more interpretable than neural networks, but generally speaking are slightly lower performance. So this is a great example from Moody's, the rating agency. The left shows, uh, the left-hand chart there shows data on how borrower defaults are clustered across the population. The middle chart is fitting a simple linear model in an effort to predict these defaults. And as you can see, it's not flexible enough and no matter how you fit it, the uh, linear model can't capture the complexity of the default patterns, which is non-linear and non-monotonic. So on the right, what they do is they fit a random forest and you see visually uh, how much better it is able to fit the data because of the increased flexibility. So using the Moody's example, I'm gonna describe how a random forest works. A, uh, a random forest is made up of decision trees like the one on this diagram. And decision trees split data into groups of observations that are similar to each other. So starting at the top, um, it's using an EBITDA to interest expense ratio, and it's splitting the data based on a value of 2.4 on that ratio. So what you find is that 33% of those firms are below that cutoff of 2.4, and they're predicted to default, so they go into box two in that bottom left corner. The other firms go into box three in the top right, and then they're split on total assets. And firms which have above 25 million in total assets are predicted not to default. They go into box seven in the bottom right. Um, and finally, the remaining data is split on current liabilities to sales. So um, those with above 0.32 on this ratio are predicted to default. And those below 0.32 on that ratio are predicted not to default. All of the data ends up getting split into these four groups and any companies in the orange groups are predicted to default. Now, um, in practice, individual decision trees like this, um, they, they, they tend to be very, very overfit. Now, um, you, you can see why, because it's splitting the data so specifically um, based on, on, on the training sample. So what a random forest does it averages across many decision trees using a process called bootstrap aggregation or bagging. So this is where each single tree is only shown a random subset of all of the data, which it's likely to overfit on. However, because each tree only sees a, a different part of the data and no one tree sees all of the data, the errors in each tree and um, diversify each other away when you average the prediction across all of them. So it's utilizing the power of diversification, which is a concept that most of you as investors should know well. Uh, using another analogy to think of it, um, uh, you can view every tree, each individual tree, as one equity analyst. Now, individual analysts can be narrow-minded in focusing on their own sector, and they can have their own biases. But if you average a prediction across a team who are each covering different sectors, you can build a more accurate, unbiased picture of reality. So in terms of application, trees don't just have to be used in the context of prediction. Uh, for example, they can also be used to sort portfolios instead of the traditional portfolio sorting procedures used when you're constructing long short factor portfolios for asset pricing. Uh, and you can also use them as a tool to interpret more complex models. So I'm gonna outline a couple of papers in the finance literature that apply machine learning. Um, and this is an area that's exploded in recent years. So um, this one is a, a very popular paper in the Review of Financial Studies 
by Gu, Kelly and Zhu. And um, it's a great one for you to read because it tests many different machine learning methods on the stock data in CRISP. So that's the securities database that most academics use for asset pricing. Now the uh, paper has its critics. Um, as is often the way when you publish a novel idea in finance, the whole of academia descends on you and tries to kill you. Um, but this study is useful uh, for giving you a flavor of how you apply each of these different machine learning methods to return prediction. And it's using both stock level fundamental data and uh, macroeconomic predictors as well. So this is one of the charts from the paper and it shows the out of sample returns based on these different models predictions. So the stocks predicted to have the highest returns are at the top of the chart in solid lines and the stocks predicted to have the lowest returns are in the dashed lines at the bottom and the S&P 500 is in black. Uh, so again, you need to approach these results skeptically as you should with all research, peer reviewed or not. But one conclusion from this paper is that the non-linear models uh, do a better job of the linear models. Um, and another conclusion which uh, I find interesting is that they, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they test neural networks with different numbers of layers. Uh, and those with small numbers of layers were the best performing. So they outperformed those which had more layers and were more complex. So this dovetails with something that we discussed earlier, which is more complexity is not always better. For those more interested in macro, as opposed to individual stocks, uh, this is a recent paper in the Journal of Financial Data Science. So that's a new journal focused on machine learning in finance, uh, which I strongly encourage you to follow. So uh, many of you know a popular trading strategy used in futures markets is time series momentum. So for those less familiar, it exploits the tendency for markets to trend, for which there's evidence going back uh, 200 years. Now, these strategies uh, need the investor to specify a method for estimating the trend. Uh, and this involves uh, deciding how far you want to look back in time when you're defining your trend, uh, and it determines the speed of your trading strategy. So instead of defining a specific trend rule, in this paper, what they do is they let the neural networks determine the positions and the portfolio. Um, and they test different neural network uh, architectures, and they also uh, test each of them with different objective functions. So we talked about minimizing mean squared error, but that's only one objective. What they did is they then compared that to models which look to maximize return or maximize a sharp ratio. Oh, excuse me. So, um, so, so the the chart here is one of the um, conclusions from the paper, which is that these uh, strategies outperform long only and traditional time series momentum portfolios. And interestingly, um, they found the best performing was an LSTM. So that's a type of neural network that can retain its own memory as an input into making predictions. So this suggests that long-term memory matters even when you're predicting short-term trends in markets. So it's very easy to get overexcited about machine learning applications in finance. So I want to end by highlighting that uh, it's best not to take extreme views either way on the potential for machine learning in investing. Um, so I've shared some intuition and some evidence that it can be additive. However, uh, I'm skeptical that machine learning, um, using investing anyway, will reach the accuracy levels that it has in other domains. Um, so it's not going to be like pressing a button and getting showered with riches like manna from heaven. Um, just to emphasize why, uh, I'm going to lean on a great example from Michael Brandt of Duke University, which I've linked to in the references if you want to watch it. So machine learning is driven by data. Uh, uh, this here is the image data that the algorithm in a self-driving car has to work with. So it's perfect signal to noise in the sense that it's a clear picture of what's actually happening on the road. Now, this is the same picture, but if for every real pixel, we add a noisy pixel. So this is basically half good data and half bad data. It's got a signal to noise ratio of one. And you can still make out the road and the cars in, in this picture, but, but barely. So what I show here are global equity market returns going back 30 years, measured on different frequencies. The first column is the average return in excess of cash. 
Um, so 5.8% on an annual basis down to about two basis points daily. This is the signal that we're looking for. The second column is the volatility across the different frequencies. Um, so this is the noise that we need to see the signal through. Uh, and the third column is the Sharpe ratio. So the average excess return divided by the volatility around that average. This is the signal to noise ratio, right? And what you can see is all of these Sharpe ratios, these signal to noise ratios are below one. Now the final column, I'm just inverting the Sharpe ratio um, so for purposes of reference of the, the next few slides. Um, but this is how much noisy data we have for every one piece of good data. So if we go back to our original image, which has perfect signal to noise, and we add noisy pixels until it has the signal to noise ratio of annual market returns data. So this is with three noisy pixels for every one true pixel. And you, again, you can maybe still make out the road and the cars here, but barely. This is the equivalent signal to noise ratio now of quarterly data. That's six noisy pixels per one true pixel. And this is monthly. And this is weekly. So um, I've shown you these to motivate a question that we should be asking ourselves. And, uh, and that is, um, would you really expect the same algorithm that is achieving superhuman results in other domains using the perfect image as an input to be able to deliver the same accuracy with this image? Um, or would you expect Netflix would be able to predict what movies that you like if for every one movie you actually wanted to watch, you then watch 23 films at random? So price data in, in financial markets uh, have a low signal to noise ratio by design. When there's any signal in the noise, there are huge financial incentives for market participants to trade on this information, thus moving market prices, which squeezes out the information and results in a low signal to noise ratio. Um, the, the efficiency of financial markets is why the applications for machine learning will be different in investing than, than we apply it in uh, other fields. Uh, investors can't just throw the data at an algorithm and expect instantly that it's going to have good results um, because when Newton discovered gravity apples didn't start floating um, and, and this is why I think um, as investors anyway our, 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 our jobs are probably safe for now so here I've, I've highlighted some references uh, including some books and some videos to, to get you started it's important to stress that there's no shortcuts here so you're going to be learning for the rest of your life long after the lockdown is over um, and I'm on this journey as well. I'm learning new things every day. So I've included my, my email address there. Um, if you have any questions or any experiences you'd like to share, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. Um, and thank you for your time. And I think we are going to take some questions now. So. So I've got a question here on um, which courses can you recommend for, for machine learning and investment? So there's, there's, there, there's so many out there. Um, maybe, maybe it's best if, I, uh, if, we, if, we, if we touch base offline and I can send you a few, um, but actually there's a lot of free resources as well. So um, the, the, the way I learned anyway is, is actually not, not, not through the lens of investing. There's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of videos from other fields such as astronomy, for example, where they go through some of these um, these concepts um, and, and, and they tend to be a bit uh, better pedagogically in my opinion than, than, than some of the investing ones um, so, so so you know if, if you send me an email I'm happy to, to send you a list of, of, of some that I've used so so another question is um, from your recent experience uh, what have machine learning models predicted in general during such a current black swan event so so that's that's difficult because it's uh, it really depends on the context in, in which you're using machine learning. I, I talked about it really from an investment perspective here, but machine learning is also being used in risk management, in 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 uh, which is which is maybe more uh, more developed, I'd say, because risk uh, predicting risk has has been easier than returns, generally speaking. In terms of in the current climate, some of the time series. Uh, strategy, uh, time series momentum strategies that that, that we touched on um, have, have generally done done quite well during uh, this current event, 
and those um, using machine learning, they have had have, have had more mixed results. Um, and that's more to do with uh, uh, if you think of how how you'd want a model to work, you'd want something that's that's relatively consistent. And obviously, a black swan event like this is is um, uh, not 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 happening every year. So so there's there's a trade off there between uh, okay how how much you want to do well during a normal year versus a a, a black swan year. And um, yeah, within within that that time series momentum space, some some using these um, these models have had some success, but some haven't. Um, given given it's 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 a rather unusual unusual time. So there's a bit of a, a waffly answer there, but but I'd say it really depends. So we've got another question here: uh, How value how valuable is machine learning in areas of finance with less data, such as project or infrastructure finance? Um, so I'm probably probably not the, the the best person to ask you. I don't really have much much experience in in those areas. But as a, as a general point, from what I mentioned, uh, machine learning is driven by data. So if your data is rubbish, then um, your your results are going to be rubbish. Uh, and and you know that's also one of the problems we have in even in finance uh, areas of finance where we have a lot of data. Um, that said, there are there are there are some areas that are being explored, um, which uh, such as transfer learning, for example, which is an, an area that says, OK, can we take data from another domain which we think may be similar to this um, to, to, to our use case, which does not have data uh, and, 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 and apply that um, sort of. Uh, yeah, is it, that, that, that's that, that field I'm, I'm less familiar with. But but from my um, from what I've seen, it's, it's still quite early days there. Another question is. Um, are there examples of retail investment funds that use machine learning? And has machine learning funds been accepted by investors? So um, retail funds. Now, now th this is a uh, this is a great question. Um, so, so part of my job is as an allocator. So, 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 so looking at um, investment processes for funds, and the pool of funds that say they're using machine learning um, versus those that are actually using it in a serious way. Um, there's a big difference there. There's uh, for and, and I guess it comes down to semantics. If you are using machine learning, but for 0.1 percent of your process, um, is it really adding anything um, or are you just doing it so that you can say that you use machine learning? And as I mentioned, it's also a very broad church. So there are some methods um, for uh, that you can combine with linear models. Which, 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 which aren't really the, what I was talking about today. I was talking about more complex models, but there are methods called regularization, for example, which is almost like risk managing the predictions you get from a linear model. And that's, um, some people classify that as machine learning. So it's, um, yeah, uh, there, there's, I, I would say if you're, if you're, if you're looking for, for funds that, that, that truly use machine learning, um, you're, you're gonna have to dig into you know, the, the, the process for those individual funds. That from from what I've seen, the ones that are serious about using it are also unfortunately the ones which are less transparent. Um, so so it becomes harder for you to actually um, filter out whether they're actually doing um, or they're using it in a serious way. Um, and I shouldn't be giving sort of recommendations on this uh, in, in in this presentation, but but I do know of a few on, which are available to retail. So so maybe if you um, if you're interested, you can you can send me an email. So we've got a couple more questions here. We know some of the famous funds that employ machine learning. Apart from Renaissance Technologies and Winton's of the World, who are the more famous later entrants? Um, so, well, uh, uh, not so much a later entrant, but, uh, but one name that goes up there with those two would be Two Sigma, um, who are well known. Um, but but as I said, these techniques are becoming more ubiquitous. So, so um, even if it's not, right uh, directly at the prediction level, there are a lot of strategies that are using this as part of their risk management, or as I mentioned, as, as uh, combining it with, with their traditional sort of process. So um, yeah, the, 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 the one that comes to mind is, is, is Two Sigma, firms like AQR, which you may say are later, you know, I think they'd admit that they're later entrants there and they're, they're, they're sort of introducing it, but um, maybe linking this to, a, to the, a few of the previous questions talking about who's using it. Um, I've, I've really talked here about the, the concepts behind it. Now, in in, instead of just using it on traditional data, uh, what, what's been a lot more popular is actually using it 
to um, structure unstructured data, if you if you like. So um, more alternative uh, data sets which can't be um, programmed in a traditional way. Um, some use machine learning, um, like language data, for example, is, is, is the easiest example. There's a um, natural language processing as a whole field of machine learning that's processing language data and turning it to something you can use in signals. So, so again, it, I, I guess it's philosophical. It's you're using machine learning there to process the data, but then what are you doing with that data? Is it um, if you're using traditional techniques on there? Is that is that what you're looking for when you say a, a fund that's using uh, machine learning? Um, so, so there, uh, there's another question here on um, how long does it take to get a basic understanding of machine learning? Half an hour, if you've been listening, uh, hopefully. Um, and R programming or Python, which one would you recommend? So I'm, I'm a bit biased. I know a bit of both, but I, um, everyone's got different opinions on this. I started using Python and I, I prefer Python. Um, in terms of the, uh, I, I'm less familiar with the, the libraries in R, but but they are, they are quite similar. It's, it's essentially, you know, are you using a colon, are you using square brackets, et cetera, if you haven't learned um, programming already. Um, the uh, in terms of my my understanding of it is that Python is 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 as a general use case anyway is um, is becoming more popular. So, uh, but again, I'm biased. What maybe what I what I suggest is if you're um, if you're if you're if you're committed to this, try a bit of both initially um, to to get a feel uh, around the basics of which you you, you prefer to use. Um, but uh, I, uh, that, that said, if you're using sort of traditional data vendors like Bloomberg, for example, they're integrating Python uh, in, 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 as, as part of their, um, as part of their, their, their data service. So you know, I, from, from what I understand as well, like Microsoft, Google, a lot of these, um, the, these platforms are, are, are using Python for, their, um, for, for any of their new tools. So again, biased opinion there, but um, yeah, may, maybe try both and uh, and decide a bit earlier on. So another question here: How responsive are machine learning models to significant shifts in input data, such as experience in recent weeks? And how many data points would be required before you can place reasonable reliability on the results? Uh, so it's, a, it's a great question. Um, so I touched on um, how a uh, one one of the papers on the time series momentum strategies and using these different neural networks. The best performing one that I mentioned was this long short term memory um, neural network approach. So, so what's interesting about that is that um, if you, when you're training, when you're training any, any, any algorithm, obviously the patterns that you want uh, it to be able to capture have to be in the data that you're training with it. Um, and, and there's this, um, uh, there's this phenomena called catastrophic forgetting, which some algorithms go through. And that's when, oh, if you're training it using, say, five years of data, um, but as you, uh, let's say, you're, you, started in, um, you started in 2013 and you had 2008, 2013, your training data. But then as you go each year, you're rolling your period. So after a year, 2008 has dropped out of your data set. And that might be an example of how the neural network will go through catastrophic forgetting. It will suddenly forget that, that, that financial crises are possible. So, so um, that, that type of neural network is, is, is trying to mitigate that by saying, okay, you're giving me new data to train on, but I'm also remembering what I've trained on before, um, even if it's not, not in this new, new training sample that you've given me. Um, I've maybe um, butchered that, that explanation, but that's, that's, that, that's one way to try and get around this, this problem because as human, it's, these neural networks are supposed to be modeled on, on, on the uh, animal brains. And as humans, we don't suddenly in one day forget you know, a, a year's worth of, of, of memories overnight. So, so there's, there's, it depends on the technique, um, but, but yeah, it, it also obviously depends on the, the input data that you've got. In terms of how many data points, um, that's that, that's a bit difficult. But um, generally speaking, in other domains, they've got far more data than we do in finance. And the Michael Brandt example that I walked through shows that how we've actually got less data even than we think we do. Um, so, so the uh, if, you, if you're talking about images, you know, some of these are are trained on millions, uh, multiple millions of of of, of, of images, and um, before they can recognise um, with a decent level of accuracy, we've only got. 100 odd years of, 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 of decent data on, on it from a time series perspective for, for um, in finance, which uh, obviously makes it difficult even if you're looking at um, daily data. Now that said, 
There is other ways, like as I mentioned, there's alternative data. If you're going instead of long history, you're going wide across lots of different observations. Um, in at a certain point in time, uh, we've got we've got sort of new data that you can use intraday data, which obviously has way more observations. And um, from my understanding, there's you know, been much more success um, with using machine learning in uh, in execution uh, on, on an intraday basis. Just a couple more questions here. So. Do you think in the future computer science skills may become incrementally more in demand by investment funds versus traditional finance backgrounds? That's a great question. So uh, I don't know, but um, in it, I guess it depends what field you want to work in I, within within uh, investing. So for for quant funds, um, for uh, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm I'm speaking generally, but they don't look for someone with a traditional finance background and, and haven't for a little while. I don't know how that's going to change in the future because as um, as investors we become more savvy with some of these techniques and we become unicorns if you like. Um, does that does does that change the picture? Is now domain knowledge within finance more interesting if everyone has the basic um, computer science skills, or if um, people like Google make use uh, utilizing these machine learning models much easier? If it's much easier, um, if it becomes almost that. Uh, as ubiquitous as everyone using Excel, you can now everyone's using TensorFlow or, or PyTorch. Then, is it really, you know, is it is, is it really that does that shift the balance in terms of domain knowledge versus um, specific computer science skills? Um, but hey, if everyone's uh, if everyone's still locked down for the next few months, then hopefully by uh, uh, by the time we all come out, we'll all be uh, uh, programming experts anyway. So. Um, do you think any of the big tech companies, such as Google, will enter the investment market at some point? Um, so, I, I I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that. Um, it, I guess it really depends on on what Google wants to achieve, whether they think there's any value from that. Um, I mean, I will say that uh, uh, it is interesting if they haven't already. Um, that maybe it's to do with this signal to noise point I mentioned. Is that actually they don't see it as a, a particularly scientific endeavor that we're all um, engaged in, and, and that it's not it's not necessarily a good use of their time if they're trying to uh, um, solve other more important problems. I don't know, um, but um, but 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 the 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 the, the point that uh, I was um, borrowing from from Michael Brandt is is exactly on on the signal to noise um, and how efficient markets tend to work. If Google enters and it becomes a big player, is it going to dominate everyone? Well, no, because its behavior is trading, is going to move prices, it's going to make things. Um, uh, if everyone's using machine learning, the market's going to behave a different way to, um, uh, to it does at the moment. And I think that is all the questions. So I. Uh, uh, I've got my email address uh, on on there, so 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 please don't hesitate if 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 there are any more um, or any feedback or or again if you want to share any of of, of your experiences. But um, thank you for your time today, and everyone be safe. <laughs>